This audio lecture provides a very brief overview of the history of animal behavior as a field. It is by no means comprehensive, but it is intended to give you some perspective about how recently the field has emerged and why some of the major domains and approaches exist. The lecture should take less than 20 minutes to watch, and you are encouraged to take notes along the way. Humans have been observing and documenting the behaviors of animals at least as long as we have kept records of our existence on this planet. Animals appear in the oldest stencils, cave art, and petroglyphs that exist. Because we depended on animals for food, some early depictions likely served as a means to understand and transfer knowledge about the habits of animals, for example the migratory patterns of game species. As an example, I'll focus on a group of animals that I love, reptiles. Chuckwallas are a large crevice-dwelling lizard in the southwestern U.S. Chuckwallas have a defensive behavior where they inflate their bodies in crevices to prevent predators from extracting them. Early Native Americans developed tools, which we call a chuckwalla hook, to pop the inflated chuckwalla and extract the animals from crevices. And paintings across the desert southwest frequently depict game important to Native Americans. In this rock painting from Southern California, a chuckwalla is depicted among other game animals commonly hunted for protein. Most anthropologists and historians also credit human domestication of animals as central to the success of our species and the growth of civilization. This includes the domestication of dogs, which have been and continue to be a vital component of our evolution for more than 15,000 years. But the roots of the modern study of animal behavior are much more recent and familiar. During the Victorian period in Europe, natural history was a fashionable pastime. It was something that educated or enlightened people participated in, and it was considered a sophisticated form of rational amusement. It became increasingly popular to go on hikes or spend time in gardens and to observe nature and posit on the behavior of animals. The problems with these types of observations is that they were largely anecdotal. That is, one would draw a conclusion about an animal's actions or motives from the observation of a single individual during a specific event. Additionally, the description of animal behaviors were highly anthropomorphic. That is, the purpose of behavior was interpreted based on its resemblance to human action, and the motives humans associate with those actions were then ascribed as animal motives. This gave rise to the notion of wise owls, clever foxes, and jealous monkeys. As we will learn towards the end of this course, ascribing such motives and emotions to other animals as assumes a certain level of cognition that is not always reasonable. It is also important to recognize that this period of observing animals had spiritual roots. Some of the first successful mass-produced books were natural history books by people like Reverend John Woods. John Woods was a Parson naturalist. A Parson naturalist was a clergyman who saw the study of natural science as an extension of his religious work. Their philosophy believed that God wanted man to understand creations by collecting and classifying organisms and documenting and studying other natural phenomena. It was believed that there was perfection in nature and that the study of nature could reveal God's intent. It is important to recognize that Charles Darwin and other important figures in the development of animal behavior and the modern life sciences were trained during that Victorian period. As a teen at a medical college, Darwin studied taxidermy and other natural sciences. Angry that he was neglecting his medical studies for natural history, Darwin's father sent him to Christ College to become a parson. Darwin continued to study natural history, and he befriended John Henslow, a botany professor, as well as others who saw natural history as a form of theology. At Cambridge, Darwin studied numerous philosophies on the natural world, including texts that argued for divine design in nature, and that God used the laws of nature to generate adaptations in plants and animals. We'll talk more about Darwin's theory on evolution in our next lecture. For now, I just want to recognize that Darwin developed his interests and skills as a naturalist during this critical period. And I also want to note that Darwin is recognized for other attributes that make him important to the field of animal behavior. Darwin was said to have uncommon common sense. He would intuit many ideas that would later be validated long after his death. 
Part of his common sense stemmed from his reliance on objective observation rather than anthropomorphic anecdotes. Darwin would also later challenge the notion of perfection in nature, particularly with regards to animal behaviors. Darwin noted that many animals differ in their traits, and that some animals have traits that are better suited to their environment than others. And so Darwin recognized that there could be imperfection in nature, or at least differences. Darwin also noted that with regards to behaviors, animals frequently make mistakes. To help illustrate this while I talk, I'll let you stare at pictures of animals getting their heads stuck in things. Darwin suggested that animals regularly make behavioral mistakes, or at least differ in their behavioral abilities, and that variation and imperfection implied a natural rather than divine origin of behaviors. Darwin was the first person to coin the concept of an instinct. An instinct is a behavior that is not learned, but an individual f performs properly the first time without practice. In other words, it's the types of behaviors that one is born with. Darwin proposed that the presence of instinctive behaviors meant that behaviors were traits that must be coded for by the same mechanisms that led to heritable physical traits, and as such, behaviors then could evolve, including by natural selection. As natural history grew into a more mature science, principles emerged that moved the field away from its roots as rational amusement and theological practice. Among those that transformed the field into a more rigorous science was C. Lloyd Morgan, who is credited with the concept of Morgan's canon. Morgan proposed that we should not interpret an animal's action, including that of a human being, as the outcome of a higher physical faculty if it can be interpreted as one that would reasonably arise from lower cognitive capacities. In other words, we should resist the interpretation of behaviors as indicative of higher cognitive functions if more simple ex explanations are possible. Morgan's canon was fundamental to the field of behaviorism, which would seek to reduce behaviors to basic elements of instinct and learning, and that animals could perform complex behaviors without higher functioning. Regrettably, Morgan's canon included a second element that was often neglected. Morgan stressed that his canon should in no way exclude the interpretation of behaviors as belonging to higher level cognitive processes, particularly if objective evidence demonstrated that those cognitive processes exist. By ignoring this portion of Morgan's canon, much of behaviorism would proceed with little recognition the potential for higher cognitive abilities in animals. The inability or dismissal of higher cognitive abilities would be neglected for the better part of the next century, and this would cause the field of animal behavior to lag, and more important, the perspective of animals as simple automata that could perform behaviors via simple mechanisms would lead to protracted and inhumane treatment of animals for the better part of a century. Another important figure in the early development of behaviorism and the modern science of animal behavior was Edward Thorndike. Thorndike championed the true elements of scientific rigor in behavioral studies, including moving away from anecdotes to multiple observations, making sound objective observations rather than being anthropomorphic, and getting researchers to look beyond the seemingly complex things that animals do, and to be more holistic in the study of animal behavior, including what he described as the neglected stupid and normal things that all animals do. He strongly advocated that observations should be repeated, that conditions should be controlled, and that the histories of subjects should be known in order to make rigorous inferences from behavioral studies. These were all principles that were well respected and recognized in other sciences. Behaviorism would see a rise in controlled experimental approaches to the study of behavior, from the infamous studies of Little Albert, a small child who was conditioned to fear cute animal faces, to Ivan Pavlov's famous studies of classic conditioning, and B.F. Skinner's revolution of the study of operant condition, best known to most of us as animals pressing buttons or levers for food. The types of cages or devices that were used in operant condition are known today as Skinner boxes. We'll learn more about classic and operant conditioning later in the course. The final three figures that I want to discuss are Conrad Lorenz, Nico Timbergen, and Carl von Frisch. Conrad Lorenz was a natural historian and comparative psychologist who spent much of his career studying instinctual behaviors in animals. He is best known 
for his work on imprinting. You can see him here in some photos of young ducks or geese, which he was famous for imprinting on him so they would follow him around. Lorenz would also give us the concept of the fixed action pattern and behavioral energy. Fixed action patterns, along with innate releasing mechanisms, form the fundamental building blocks of behaviors. We will discuss these concepts in a future lecture. Nico Timbergen was a graduate student of Conrad Lorenz, and by most accounts the most important modern figure in the study of animal behavior. Timbergen collaborated and built upon Lorenz's ideas of fixed action patterns and energy. Timbergen proposed that animals build up motivational impulses in centers within their nervous system, but this energy is inhibited from release. He proposed that these inhibitions are released by an innate releasing mechanism that allows behavioral energy to flow to the next center until a behavior is ultimately expressed. In addition to being a brilliant scientist and natural historian, Tim Bergen was a very charismatic individual who collaborated on films and magazine articles that brought the study of animal behavior to the public. Arguably Tim Bergen's most important contribution to animal behavior was the realization that the field of behaviorism had focused exclusively on causal mechanisms of behavior, for example instincts, learning, hormones, and how it behaviors developed over an individual's lifetime, what we refer to as ontogeny. Ontogeny simply means the development of an organism to adulthood. Tim Bergen said that our understanding of animal behavior is incomplete if it does not also address the adaptive value of behaviors and the evolutionary history of behaviors. The adaptive value of behavior required a focus on how behaviors affect the survival and reproductive success of animals in the field and the evolutionary history of behaviors would be important to understand how behaviors have been shaped in lineages over deeper time scales. Tim Bergen proposed that animal behavior has four core domains. Causation, which we think of as things like genes, neurotransmitters, hormones, sensory systems, learning. Ontogeny, which is how behaviors change over an animal's time in their development into adulthood. Function, which refers to how behaviors affect an animal's ability to survive and reproduce. That is, what is the adaptive value of a behavior? And evolution, which refers to the historical development of behaviors over generations. Today we recognize these domains largely under the two major fields of psychology and behavioral ecology. It is the science of animal behavior that unifies these two major subdisciplines. Tim Bergen was also a pioneer in the study of animal behavior in the field. The importance of controlling environments and knowing animal histories had relegated a large amount of behavioral research to laboratory and captive animal populations. The field was skeptical of the ability to do rigorous work on animal behavior in natural settings. Tim Bergen demonstrated the ability to conduct creative and rigorous experimental studies of animal behavior in the field. For example, Tim Bergen observed a strange behavior in oyster catchers, which is a bird species we can find in Georgia and New Zealand. All around the world, oyster catcher females lay three eggs, but they can typically only sit on one to two eggs depending on how close the eggs end up together. Tim Bergen hypothesized that larger eggs are generally going to produce healthier offspring, so he proposed that a female would be motivated to choose her larger eggs over smaller eggs in her clutch. To test his hypothesis, Tim Bergen painted eggs to resemble oyster catcher eggs and conducted experiments to look at responses to different levels of stimuli. First, he presented oyster catchers with their natural egg, which you can see here in the foreground of this drawing. A painted herring gold egg, which is off to the left, and a painted egg of some giant bird species. What he showed was that the oyster catcher would try to incubate the giant egg, even though it was so ridiculous it could barely sit on the egg. Tim Bergen also tried another experiment where he created clutches of five eggs which would never occur naturally and he showed that a female oyster catcher was motivated to leave her own natural clutch of three eggs and try to incubate the larger clutch. What Tim Berger discovered would later be termed supernormal stimulus which refers to the preference of animals for stimuli that differ substantially from any natural stimulus that they ever encounter. This concept will become fundamental to our understanding of many animal behaviors, including the evolution of communication systems 
and things like mate choice. Tinbergen also examined the function of a spot found on the bills of most gulls. Gull chicks peck at this spot, which causes the parent to regurgitate food for the chick. Tinbergen created a model puppet parent that either had no spot or spots that varied in color and contrast. He recorded the rate at which chicks pecked at the spot on each model. What he found was that chicks pecked most at spots with high contrast. And the highest rate was for a red spot, similar to that found naturally on the parent's bill. He demonstrated that the red spot serves as a stimulus for releasing begging behavior in chicks. Finally, in one of my favorite experiments, Timbergen focused on mating and courtship in three-spined sticklebacks. Like many animal species, male three-spined sticklebacks are brightly colored, often red, while females are generally drab. Like many fish, male sticklebacks also build nests and care for their developing eggs and fry. Tim Bergen wanted to test that the red color in males was driving female mate choice. So he created a range of models to present to females and he recorded their interest in courtship. He started with a realistic model of a male stickleback that lacked any red color. And then he presented females with models that barely resembled fish but had the distinctive red coloration on their ventral surfaces. As expected, female sticklebacks preferred the models with the red color to the plain but more natural looking male model. Tim Bergen had demonstrated that females have a sensory bias for red color when selecting mates, and this has likely driven the evolution of this color in males. The final person I want to mention is Carl von Frisch. Von Frisch was a pioneer in studying animal sensory and communication systems. In particular, he was credited with deciphering the honeybee dance. Through a series of clever experiments and painstaking observations, von Frisch figured out that bees returning from nectar sources would perform a waggle dance. The angle of the dance told the bees the direction to the food source, the length of the dance communicated the distance, and the number of bees tapped would recruit a sufficient number of helpers proportionate to the food source. Aristotle was one of the first to document the intriguing behavior of honeybees. How is it, for instance, that a colony coordinates its workers' activity? What appears to be a random swarming mass of life may actually be intelligent behavior. A foraging honeybee will eventually discover a new food source, such as a freshly blooming flower or artificial feeder placed by a scientist. After this visit, an interesting thing happens. Over the next few minutes, many other bees arrive at the same location. They don't travel as a group. Instead, each bee finds the food source individually. How could these bees, who held no previous knowledge of this site, suddenly know precisely where the feeder was located? Is it possible that the animals communicate amongst themselves? To answer this question, Austrian biologist Karl von Frisch devised a series of experiments in the 1940s. Researchers at Georgia Tech have reproduced von Frisch's pioneering experiments using a modern observation hive. Two feeders are placed in different directions away from the hive. At each location, visiting honeybees are marked with a small spot of paint. A separate color of paint is used at each station. So, when a bee returns to the hive, it can easily be determined which feeding site it visited. Before von Frisch, other scientists had observed that returning bees tended to waggle about excitedly in a figure eight pattern before sharing the collected pollen and nectar with their hive mates. In this two station experiment, von Frisch noticed that the bees returning from the same feeding source danced differently from bees that arrived from the other location. While both sets of bees perform the classic figure eight dance, the orientation of the dances is offset between the two groups. Bees returning from one feeder perform a rotated version of the dance done by the other bees. Incredibly, the angle of rotation precisely matches the angle between the feeding stations and the hive. This must be a clue to the mystery of how the bees are able to share information about the location of food. 
Through further experimentation, details of the grammar of the honeybee's dance language began to emerge. Inside of a dark vertically oriented beehive, the natural shared reference point is gravity, establishing both an up and a down direction. A bee's solar compass and internal clock provides another communal reference point, the sun. By pairing these two global constants, the bees form a simple language. Within the hive, the direction up, away from gravity, substitutes for the location of the sun. Then the angle that the bee dances compared to this up direction is the same angle a bee should fly away from the sun in order to find the target flower. So if the bee dances directly upward, other bees know that they can find flowers by flying directly towards the sun. If a bee dances 90 degrees to the left, then bees leaving the hive should fly 90 degrees to the left of the sun. A bee angling its dance towards the ground will let others know to fly directly away from the sun. As the day goes by, the bee will even use its internal clock to adjust for the movement of the sun in the sky. This lets fellow workers always know the correct direction to travel in order to find food. The central waggle section of the bee's dance also contains information about the distance to a food source. Longer time spent in this part of the dance means that the food is further away. Shorter durations mean that the food is closer by. In general, a bee increases the duration of this section by one second for every kilometer of distance to the food. When food is within several meters of the hive, this central section of the dance will shrink, causing a circular dance. For bees, distance is actually measured by the amount of energy it takes them to travel. Thus, a strong headwind could cause a bee to dance as if the food came from a further distance away. Again, the information contained in a honeybee's dance consists of two parts. One, the orientation of the dance which describes what angle to travel away from the sun, and two, the duration of the middle part of the dance which expresses the distance of a food source away from the hive. At Georgia Tech's Multi-Agent Robotics and Systems Laboratory, our goal is to work with scientists to automate the tracking and help understand the organization of multiple automata. By harnessing new computer vision techniques, we can more efficiently and effectively study the behavior of large colonies of living organisms. This information can help us uncover more secrets behind animal communication and lead to innovations in robotics. Von Frisch's discovery was fundamental because it demonstrated sophisticated communication capabilities in something as simple as a honeybee. Many people remained skeptical of Von Frisch's discovery and proposed alternative mechanisms by which bees could recruit to nectar sources in his experiments. They were always critical that he had never collected data on the actual flight paths of individual bees, until 2005 that is, when researchers fitted bees with transponders so they could track the actual flight paths of bees. In a clever experiment published in Nature, researchers placed a feeder away from a hive, just as von Frisch had done. They allowed a bee to fly from the hive to the nectar source and then return. Researchers would let the bee, who had returned, do his dance. They would record that dance, and then they would block any bees from leaving the hive. They would relocate the hive, and then when the bees were leaving, they would trap the bees and place the transponder diode on each bee so they could record its actual flight path. The question they had was, would the bees automatically find the original nectar source, or would they fly the flight path that the bee, who had returned to the hive, had performed in his dance? What they demonstrated was that individual bees were flying precisely according to the instructions provided in the returning bees dance. You can see in the lower portion of the figure that the bees leaving displaced hives flew to where they expected the nectar source to be based on the instructions 
provided by their hive mate. In 1973, Conrad Lorenz, Nico Timbergen, and Carl von Frisch shared the Nobel Prize in Medicine. It remains only the second Nobel Prize awarded in the area of animal behavior. Why was the award in medicine? Well, simply there is no Nobel Prize in animal behavior. But the legacy of what they accomplished and the solidification of animal behavior as a science was worthy of the distinction and they propelled the field into what it is today.